Bene, buonasera. Uno. Good evening. One of the greatest contemporary evil is uh, a trend or tendency to diminish uh, other people, uh, other cultures, uh, other faiths, uh, to a stereotype, uh, to a preset pattern. The meeting has always fought against this tendency, against this enemy. We want to meet each other. We want to get to know each other. We want to confront each other and we want to learn from one another. And it is exactly in this spirit that tonight we are going to deal with a, a very thorny issue, a very significant issue. And to do this, we have gathered two ex three experts, two Muslim and a Christian, in order to further analyze and get to know better the itineraries, uh, the roads of Islam, this great religion, this great confession, which gathers one-fifth of mankind. What are the crossroads, uh, the cultural combinations, the cultural debate uh, that crosses this world? What is uh, the, what we call education? What are we going to discuss today in this respect? And building on these foundations, building on this, trying to achieve greater knowledge, we want to try and understand which are the paths that can help us discover or rediscover the true dialogue. What uh, Wail Farouk, Wail Farouk doesn't like this very much. He doesn't like the word dialogue. He has said it uh, repeated many, many times because he wants to use the word meeting. And we need to acknowledge that sometimes he knows things uh, better than we do. So what are the foundations that we can uh, lay to have a very deep meeting and a true meeting? And what is going on uh, in the Arabic world? Deeply touches uh, the conscience of this world, the conscience of uh, current Islam. So we have summoned today three experts uh, who will help us uh, further analyze. This meeting is uh, a real analysis. We want to know better, we want to know more. I would like to introduce our three speakers uh, through a quotation which uh, is taken from The Educational Risk by Don Giussani. Educational Risk was translated in Arabic by one of our friends, and the quotation is as follows. Real education must be education to criticism. It must become, what they've told us, must become a problem. That is, we need to use our reason. Education to criticism implies the use of our reason, of our mind. If it's not a problem, it's never going to become mature, and we're going to irrationally leave it or abandon it, or we will keep it inside ourselves, always irrationally. In Greek, uh, this searching within ourselves is called kringain, crisis, which means criticism. Criticism is making oneself reason of things. I thought this would be a great introduction for our meeting. And now let me introduce uh, our speakers. First of all, Abdel Fattah Hassan, professor of Italian literature at the Ain Shams University in Cairo. Many of you know him already, have already met him. For he is one of uh, the great friends that we have on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea. It's uh, the third time you are here at the meeting, isn't it? Oh, next one. So this is the second, and the third one will be the next one, uh, upon God's will. So I was corrected by Professor Hassan. He speaks uh, perfectly Italian, so he will speak in Italian. 
these days uh, walking in corridors in lobbies, uh, I'm, I've, I meet people who have learned Italian through his teachings. So it's wonderful uh, to, to disseminate uh, very much in the world uh, and uh, Arabic, uh, classic Arabic, uh, and uh, meeting people who have learned something from us. Then second speaker, Robert Riley, Senior Fellow for Strategic Communication at the American Foreign Policy Council. Robert Riley is a, a new friend of our meeting. Allow me to call you this way. He was the director of Voice of America. He served the White House as special assistant to the president uh, from 1983 to 1985. He did very many things, uh, which I'm not going to tell you now. And he's uh, a very sophisticated uh, music expert. He wrote a wonderful book called The Surprise by Beauty. But uh, he is not coming uh, here today under that hat uh, that is uh, as a sophisticated uh, expert of contemporary music, but instead uh, he will come here as uh, a, an expert on Islam on a specific historical period. He has written a significant book uh, which hasn't unfortunately been translated into Italian uh, so far, but uh, who knows, maybe in the future we may open this road, and it is called The Closing of the Muslim Mind. And it uh, recalls uh, the title of another famous book, but I'm going to stop here, otherwise uh, we go further away, we drift uh, too much. But first of all, I would like to welcome our great friend, Professor Well Farouk, uh, Vice President of Meeting Cairo. Waiting for us early November in Cairo, inshallah, can we say it? And he's a very great friend of our meeting. Many of you have already known him and met him and heard him in previous uh, years. So now I immediately give the floor to Professor Adel Abdel Fattah Hassan. You have the floor and you can speak your wonderful Italian. Please stay, stay seated, stay here because I will uh, Keep the schedule better. Uh, God's peace be on you, on all the audience, and I'd like to take this opportunity to warmly thank the organizers of this uh, meeting, uh, the foundation of the Remini meeting uh, for friendship among peoples, uh, for allowing me to be here among uh, you in order to increase my experience in um, a setting of friendship and mutual respect. As a university student and as a professor of uh, Arabic language uh, with the Pomonian Fathers, I started this uh, pathway long ago. I will talk about Islam today between uh, education and reason. We'll talk about ideals and reality. We'll talk about both an ideal situation and the real situation, though there is a gap between the two. First of all, many greetings from the land of Nile, Egypt, which is stepping ahead towards the Second Republic, which we hope is going to be democratic Egypt based on the Constitution and on the respect of rights of all citizens with no distinction. So really open Egypt. The word reason to me is as follows, means as follows, means the following. It's either a material meaning, it either has a material meaning aiming at material progress and scientific progress or moral uh, progress uh, leading to being moderate uh, in your thoughts. Uh, talking about uh, authentic Islam, uh, actually there's um, no clash against uh, reason uh, or the possibility of taking advantage uh, from uh, the um, other's sciences uh, and Islam as such uh, frees the mind uh, from uh, blind imitation and uh, 
um, what is fake because the human reason has for a long uh, period of time been the prisoner of legends and superstitions. Islam also helped people get rid or get out of the inclination of following parents or ancestors, which immobilized reason and sort of obstacle the, the prophet's uh, pre preaching. Islam, even if uh, in uh, the application of it there are some negative sides, and we'll talk about this, Islam frees the mind from conditionings and uh, being slave to people who are leaders and powerful. Islam forbids following leaders and great characters, be they political leaders or people with a social, uh, a high social status. The Quran um, does not agree with this uh, behavior of following uh, the um, leaders and uh, major characters without uh, thinking. And again, the Quran uh, reports the dialogues which will take place on the day of judgment, uh, the dialogues between uh, those that follow the others and those that are followed, uh, where everyone will blame the others. It's Surah 33 verses 67-68, Surah 2 verses 166-167. Um, God Almighty created the mind not for it to be blocked or restricted or restrained in such a way that man is no longer capable of reflecting and leaves reflections to a third party. Islam uh, prohibits uh, standardization uh, without uh, reasoning. Uh, Prophet uh, Muhammad said this in, uh, uh, what, in one of his sayings called Hadith. None of you uh, should be deprived of um, their opinion. And if men act well, then I also act well. If the others act badly, I also act badly. You shouldn't do this. You have to be more resolute. Islam promoted critical and scientific spirit, a critical and scientific spirit which opposes commonplaces, superficiality, and believing everything. In many verses, we have expressions like this. Aren't you reasoning? Aren't you reflecting? This is found, for example, in the third surah, verse 190. Quran. Um, spurs us to observe everything. It invites to meditation and contemplation of the creation of the skies and the earth. It invites to meditating on crea the creation of human beings uh, and spurs us to study the, sto the history of peoples in order to draw some, le some lessons. And Islam gives the reason, the task of reflecting in order to reach two fundamental truths. Even if uh, God's faith is part of a natural in and original inclination, which is called fitra, it is essential to use logic and reason by if you dialogue with the non-believers. And it's up to the reason to prove uh, the existence of all God uh, Almighty and the existence of prophecies by studying and analyzing the God's, the divine miracles and also the clear evidence. Islam spurs us to um, carry out research in science and it is a religious obligation to search for science and draw benefit from it. As uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad said, uh, 
peace be on him. Uh, research for knowledge is a precept. Uh, it's an obligation for all Muslims. Over and above religious sciences, um, there are um, settings of research uh, or sectors of research where of science where research is a collective duty. This encompasses uh, all that is useful in human life. For example, the presence of specialized knowledge um, in medicine, mathematics, architecture, etc. Therefore, you need uh, Muslim specialists that deal with the needs of the community and the society. Islam, therefore, raises uh, the rank of science and uh, scholars. The Almighty says, uh, those that know and those that do not know, are they perhaps the same? This is verse 9 of Surah 39. Uh, this verse is, does not only concern religious science, but science in general. It's a comparison between scholars and ignorant people, between those that know and those that do not know, between light and obscurity. See verse 11 of Surah 58. There are many a hadith of the Prophet that mentioned the merits of science and scientists. I can state certainly that Islam contributed to achieving an unprecedented level in um, the study and implementation of science uh, in freeing uh, the reason and in building a society on objective basis by raising the rank of knowledge and scholars. I remember the golden times of Ibn Khaldun and Avicenna and Averroe, who are maybe known also in the Western world. Between science and religion, there is no contradiction. There can be no contradiction between science and faith, between revelation and reason. Because of historical reasons, we have to verify the accurateness of what is uh, uh, conveyed to us. And in uh, Don Giussani's uh, book, uh, The Educational Risk, I was really pleased to translate this into Arabic. Uh, the uh, sacred book, uh, talks about uh, uh, botanics, uh, medicine, general science, oceanology, etc. Islam is in favor of taking what is good and useful for, from anything, be this uh, old or modern, coming from Muslims or others. Uh, the believers must uh, anchor to wisdom uh, wherever it comes from uh, and wherever it's found. During the uh, centuries of development and prosperity, Muslims uh, drew a benefit from uh, what uh, was best in the other countries. They took advantage of the others' knowledge in medicine, chemistry, etc. They also translated Persian, uh, Greek, or Indian works. They developed sciences, corrected mistakes, and changed what needed to be changed. They added their discoveries to the others' knowledge, not only their discoveries, but also their innovations and creativity. The epoch of decay due to foreign occupation, I think, and tyranny led um, the science and uh, the uh, thinking, uh, the process of thinking to a period of stagnation. There is, in my opinion, a detachment or a gap between Islam as a religion which spurs people to scientific research and opening the horizons of uh, the reason and real life or the real behavior of Muslims. If there is an encounter, a sort of harmony, a system, a theory, the results, the application of the theory will give very good results. After the Arab Spring and after the collapse of totalitarian regimes that had as their consequences poverty, ignorance, and going back to the past, and we must confess this uh, without sweetening the pill, we as Muslims must uh, uh, trigger uh, reason so that it uh, 
um, overcomes the inertia. We have to overcome the inertia so that the reason invents something and has the right creativity for the progress of mankind. When our ancestors understood the importance of this harmony, then we saw um, the climax of um, intellectual uh, of intellectuals in Andalusia, for example, and also in the Arab world, a multifaceted culture, and I mentioned some of these uh, people already. So I need to uh, say that the, especially after the um, collapse of uh, tyranny in our Muslim world, it is a duty for us to educate the reason of the next generations. It's up to us. It's our responsibility as intellectuals, as educators, as university professors, as parties, as schools, institutions in general, volunteers, etc. It's our task, our responsibility to give importance uh, to educating the reason of our future generations. Um, in my opinion, this has a twofold implication. Um, to me, on the one hand, this education to reasoning uh, for our young generations uh, induces uh, a broadening of the horizons. Uh, promoting critical spirit and science. On the other hand, this uh, fosters uh, logical thought, uh, being moderate and tolerant, and uh, friendship among people. Because the more educated the reason is, the weaker the inclination towards prejudice, uh, misunderstanding, and being closed-minded. I appeal to God the Almighty so that he gives us the strength and possibility to be up to the challenge of educating the reason and educating the mind of our new generations so that they can face the future. We as educators, as intellectuals, as an intellectual elite, as politicians, have great responsibility in this respect. You know, the, well, certainly young people will have to be educated. If we can't educate the reason of the new generation, we cannot um, we cannot uh, send uh, people to the moon to bring back uh, the uh, flask of wisdom as Ludovico Ariosto did with Orlando Furioso. Thank you. Grazie, grazie, professor. Thank you very much, Professor Hassan for this very nice uh, final quotation of Italian literature and Ludovico Ariosto. And now, let's add another viewpoint. Robert Riley, as I said, studied uh, for a long time Islam, interfacing with very many Islam uh, personalities around the world. And today, he will uh, make us a summary of, this, of his activity on Islam. Thank you very much for being here and coming here from the US. Thank you, Professor Fontanlan. Thank you, Rimini. What a great joy it is to be with you and with my Muslim colleagues here. Assalamu alaikum. I was going to begin by reading a prayer in which the person praying asks for mercy from God, for a good death, for life with him, knowledge of him, and a following of the sure path. Unfortunately, it's in my hotel room. 
it slipped out as I was trying to lighten the mess that you see before you on my desk. But let me tell you the reason why I wanted to begin with it uh, was for you to have an immediate appreciation that this was a prayer that all Muslims say in the seventh circling of the Kaaba during the Hajj. And what it makes so immediately clear is that Muslims seek the will of God and as such uh, obviously deserve our respect whether we're Christians, Buddhists, or of any other faith or of none. Uh, now, to, to move on to contemporary events, I begin with a quote from Tariq Hagi, who is in a famous Egyptian, a uh, very famous businessman, a thinker, and now uh, founded a political party in the Arab Spring venue. Tariq Hagi said, and I quote, what happened in Tunisia and Egypt and what is happening in many Arab countries cannot be properly understood except through the intellectual history of the Arab-speaking societies over the last 1400 years. So in my remaining 18 minutes, I will cover the last 1400 years without which what is happening today would be incomprehensible. I'm afraid it's even worse than that because I'm going to put my brief remarks within the framework of Pope Benedict XVI's Regensburg Lecture within which he spoke, he gave a diagnosis of what is wrong with the West by describing its de-Hellenization, its loss of reason, its loss of philosophy, the gift of the Greeks. That was the major portion of the Regensburg Lecture. The smaller part addressed Islam and the de-Hellenization of Islam as a diagnosis of its ills. Now, what, does he, what was he meaning by the de-Hellenization? What is Hellenization to begin with? And for that, we have to go back 2,500 years to ancient Greece and the revolution in human thinking that arrived in the 6th, 5th century before Christ when the notion became prevalent that the universe is an intelligible whole and that we are able to comprehend it with our reason. How can this be? That it, reality exterior to us, the universe, has a principle of order within it which our reason can comprehend. Then we find the first use of the word by the philosophers Heraclitus and Parmenides who said, the universe is intelligible because it was ruled by and is the product of thought. Not will, but of thought. The universe was first thought. And there is a wisdom behind all things which Heraclitus and Parmenides called logos. It is logos which makes the world intelligible. Logos, as you know, is the Greek word for reason. Now, the assimilation of Greek philosophy is what the Pope meant by the Hellenization. The Hellenization of the West is uh, known to you all because Christianity itself became Hellenized. It, is, it assimilated the thought of Plato and Aristotle. And within it, uh, used the means of Greek philosophy to reach a reconciliation of reason and faith. Now, what did the Holy Father mean when he spoke of the de-Hellenization of Islam? What, to begin with, was its Hellenization? And this will be the subject of my brief remarks to you. When Islam emerged from the Arabian Peninsula, it conquered, of course, the Persian Empire and large parts of the Byzantine Empire, within which it encountered for the first time 
philosophical notions that survived in the Hellenic centers of learning in Alexandria and other places, as well as the assimilated Hellenic thinking that was present in Christian apologetics and theology. Therefore, Islam was confronted with the following questions as it had to develop its own apologetics in light of the idea of reason, the relationship between reason and its own revelation, and ultimately the relationship between reason and God. For instance, can we come to know God through our reason? Uh, what is uh, uh, the relationship between the revelation of God and our reason? Can we apprehend it through our reason? In answer to these questions, the first fully developed uh, Islamic school of theology arose, which was called the Mutazala, the Mutazalites. And let me briefly give you their account of things. It goes somewhat like this. God has given man reason as a gift of his grace, through which to come to know him in the order of his creation. How can that be? Because the order of creation is itself rational. So through your mind, in examining creation, you can come to knowledge of God. How do you do this? Abdul Jabbar was one of the great Mutazilite theologians whose works we have uh, extensive evidence of. Al Jabbar began by saying, man's first duty, and this won't sound like the Islam with which you may be familiar, man's first duty is to reason, not to submit. Why? Because, Al Jabbar said, the uh, the existence of God is not self-evident. You must use your speculative reason to arrive at the existence of God in the first place. And how do we do this? By examining creation. And in creation we see nothing is its own cause. And you can't have an infinite regression of things that are not its own cause. There must be an uncaused cause. There must be a primary cause. So man then can arrive at the conclusion through his speculative reason that indeed there is a God. Then the next question arises. Has God spoken? Has God entered history? Is there a revelation? Well, in fact, there are competing revelations. And how then do we know whether the revelation is genuine? Once again, he answered, with the priority of reason. It is through your reason in examining the revelation, uh, which is the test of its authenticity. Is the revelation reasonable? This doesn't mean that there's no mystery in the revelation. It doesn't mean that the things in the revelation are things to which you could come through your reason alone. It means that once it's revealed to you, does it seem unreasonable? Is there anything in the revelation that asks you to deny your reason in order to accept it? And uh, Abdul Jabbar said, no. God would not give you reason through which to come to know him in the rational order of creation and then give you a revelation in which he required you to deny this very same reason. Why? Because God is both the source of the revelation and of your reason. So these must be coherent. Therefore, in examining the Quran, he said, for instance, uh, there are uh, contradictions if you take them literally. The Quran says that God has feet, he has hands, and he sits on a throne. How can this be? Uh, we know that God is a pure spirit. Well, if you take it literally, uh, it's unreasonable. Therefore, said uh, 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 Al-Jabbar, you're not meant, that's a signal to you that this, this is meant metaphorically. So you bring what doesn't accord with reason into accord with reason by coming to an understanding of it as a metaphor, not as a literal thing. 
Now, the Mutazilite school, be, these uh, rational theologians became known as the people of God's rationality and his justice. And we have just dealt with the rationality part. By the justice part, uh, they meant this. Man is given by God through his reason, the ability to come to know good and evil, to come to know what is just and what is unjust. And because man, not Muslim man, every man, all people, have this ability to come to this moral knowledge, it is only because of this gift that they are obligated to choose the good. Had they no way to know the good, how could God obligate them to choose it? So first he gives man the ability to, of, uh, to obtain moral knowledge. And then of course he gives them the freedom to choose it. Because how could God hold you responsible for choosing something if you weren't free to choose it? So the doctrine became uh, what reason could know in the moral sphere and man's freedom. And so profound did these teachings uh, permeate uh, the society by the time of Caliph al-Mamun, who himself was the greatest proponent, uh, proponent of Greek thinking in Muslim history, that free will became a state doctrine. Al-Mamun had a dream, it is said, in which Aristotle appeared to him. And he asked Aristotle, what is the good? And Aristotle answered, it is what is rationally good. So Al-Mamun embraced this answer, sponsored the Mutazila theologians, he sponsored Al-Kindi, the first uh, Muslim philosopher, who, by the way, uh, whose teaching is perfectly reflected in what Professor Fakat Hassan said about seeking truth no matter where, from where it comes. Now, I, I want to just give you a little historical flavor of how Hellenized Islam was in the first half of the ninth century by reading to you the preface of a debate that was held in Al-Mamun's court between a Christian and one of the uh, caliph's cousins, Ibn Ishmael. This exchange took, an, uh, uh, took the form of a series of letters. And Caliph Al-Mamun was so fascinated by this exchange that he had them read to him nonstop. So what does the Muslim say to the Christian as a condition for the dialogue? Quote, Therefore, bring forward all the arguments you wish, and say whatever you please, and speak your mind freely. Now that you are safe and free to say whatever you please, appoint some arbitrator who will impartially judge between us and lean only towards the truth and be free of the force of passion. And that arbitrator shall be reason, whereby God makes us responsible for our own rewards and punishments. Hereby I have dealt justly with you and have given you full security and, and am ready to accept whatever decision reason may give for me or against me. Isn't that extraordinary? Abdul Jabbar made his teaching clear in this st statement. It is obligatory for you to carry out what accords with reason. Reason is morally normative. You must behave reasonably, otherwise you are acting against God. Now, here's the crisis. Here's the problem. In opposition to the Mutazilites arose the next theological school in Islam called the Asherites after Al-Ashari. And they denied every single tenet of Mutazilite teaching. God is not rationality and justice. He is pure will and absolute power. He is unbound by anything. 
In the Regensburg lecture, uh, the Pope quotes Ibn Hazm, who wasn't an Asherite, but he, think, he thought the same, who said, God is not bound even by his own word. How dare the Mutazilites have proffered a conception of justice to which God would be held accountable. For Abdul al-Jabbar said, uh, God will punish those who disobey him and he will reward those who obey him. And were God to reward those who disobey him and punish those who obeyed him, he would be a tyrant. The Asherites responded, this is impious blasphemy. God can do anything he wills, and he may reward those who disobey him and reward and, and punish those who obey him. And he cannot be gainsaid for it. Number two, man does not have the ability through his reason to come, know, to, come to know good or evil. Why? Because his reason is corrupted by self-interest, but more importantly, because there is nothing good or evil in itself, but only as God says so. In other words, is murder evil in itself? Does God forbid murder because it's evil? Or is it evil because he forbids it? Their answer was, no, it's only evil because he forbids it. And he could change his mind and make ritual murder uh, obligatory, and there would be no gainsaying him. Um, they also denied, in their idea of God's omnipotence, that there was any causality in nature. There was no cause and effect in the natural world. Fire doesn't burn cotton, God does. A rock doesn't fall because of gravity. Uh, it's God who makes the rock fall. The rock may rise upward or go sideways next time. There is no intelligible sequence of cause and effect in the natural world, only the primary cause of God itself acting directly uh, with the result. The loss of cause and effect in the natural world makes reality unintelligible. The spread of these Asherite views was guaranteed by three caliphs after al-Mamun, Mutawakil, who suppressed the Mutazilite school of theology, advanced the Asherite school of theology, shut the house of wisdom in Baghdad, which had begun the great translations of the Greek works, and to wrap it up within Roberto's time limit, I will simply say that the triumph of Asherite theological school within Sunni Islam, it became the majority theological school. This formed most particularly Arab Islamic culture. And it, to my mind, is accountable for the loss of education, uh, the degeneration of education into memorization, to the loss of original science uh, and to the decline from which the, particularly the Mer Arab Middle East has suffered uh, after being the leading civilization at that time in the world. When we speak, as Professor Fatah Hassan did, of, of, of the golden age of Islam, it is back to the 9th, 10th century that we are referring the time at which Islam was Hellenized. All right, I have to just quickly go to the relevance of this to today. Thomas Aquinas, a good Italian, was approached by his fellow Dominicans who said, how are we supposed to deal with these Muslims? And Thomas Aquinas responded this way. He said, well, you can't deal with them from our revelation because they don't accept it. 
and you can't deal with them from their revelation because we don't accept it. Therefore, you have to treat them as natural men. What did he mean by that? He meant you appeal to their reason. Now what happens if within the West we have de-Hellenized ourselves through the acceptance of moral and cultural relativism which has undermined the status of reason to come to know the truth of reality and we face an Islamic culture which has also been de-Hellenized for other reasons in the way in which I spoke. How are we supposed to talk to each other if we've both been de-Hellenized? And that is, I think, the profound wisdom in the Regensburg Lecture, which calls for a re-Hellenization of the West, a restoration of the status of reason, and also for the re a re-Hellenization of Islam. When I had the opportunity to ask one of the leading Muslim intellectuals in Europe, uh, who is a Syrian, a man of enormous learning, I said, I will give you uh, unlimited power, unlimited resources for 10 years. Tell me how you're going to turn around the Islamic world. He stopped and thought for a moment and then said, I'd re-Hellenize it. How curious, the same prescription uh, as Benedict XVI gave. And it is... Uh, it, we who are still Hellenized uh, can have profound conversations together. I want to make clear to you that though the, t the title of my book is The Closing of the Muslim, uh, excuse me, The Closing of the Muslim Mind, it is dedicated to the courageous men and women of the Islamic world who are struggling for a reopening of the Muslim mind. And I know I'm with some of them today. God bless you. Grazie. Grazie Robert Riley per la vastità con cui e anche la profondità e la sintesi con cui ci ha saputo raccontare e descrivere Thank you very much for the depth with which you could uh, face with such important issues such as re hellenization I won't uh, take away time from Wail Farouk. He will be angry with me. He didn't forgive me from last year. I hope he will do this this year. I'll give him the floor. He will be uh, helped by a PowerPoint pr presentation as well, so it will be easier for us to follow him. Thank you, Wahil. I don't want to say that I I'm happy to be here, as any uh, guest would say, but as Father Giussani said, um, life is here and now. Here and now, I am with you. I'm living with you, even if I will speak English. The title of my talk is The Rationality of Religion and the Irrationality of Religiosity. And I couldn't think of a better introduction after the, what uh, Professor Hassan and uh, Professor Reilly said. The Arabic root aqala, from which the word aql, reason, is derived, appears 49 times in the Noble Quran and every time except once it appears in the form of a verb conjugated in the present tense. Most of the time in the plural ta'qilun or ya'qilun the verb ta'qilun it's like you reason repeated 24 times the verb ya'qilun 
which means they reason, is repeated 22 times. Whereas each of the verbs aqala, reason to reason in past, naqilu, we reason, yaqilu, he or she, uh, he reason, appears only once. Whenever this root appears in the Quranic verses, it is always in the context of an invitation to employ reason to understand nature and the human being. In, on, in order to connect with God, it is said, for example, in Quran, the worst of pieces in Allah's sight are the deaf, the dumb, who have no reason. Have they not traveled in the land, and have they hearts wherewith to reason, and the ears wherewith to hear? For indeed, it's not the uh, eyes that grow blind, but it is the hearts which are within the bosoms that glow blind. The noun aqala, reason, does not appear in the Quran because it's a, it is neither a concept nor an essence, nor a perfect and fixed it, uh, it, uh, entity. It is a process of becoming and a journey, an action and a practice here. And it is expressed by a verb in the, in a, in the present tense because what we are concerned with is its realization now, not in the past or the future. Moreover, it is conjugated in the plural because it is the language we all share, an element of the unity that guarantees and protects plurality. In Quranic context, reason is a bridge connecting the human being with nature, the human being with God, and the I with the other. This is why Whenever the verb aqala is negated, it is also combined by a metaphor that indicates a break in this connection, deafness, dumbness, blindness. God Almighty says, will they then not mediate on the Quran, or are there locks on their hearts? The verb mediate, yatadabbarun, is a synonym of yata'aqalun, to be reasonable or to use reason, an action without which the heart, where the spirit resides, remains prisoner. Without aql, reason, the human being is not free, but is, on the contrary, prisoner of prejudice, stereotypes, and the frozen traditions that forbid life which in turn is the encounter with God, his creatures, and the others. In Quranic context, reason is a permanent connection. In, is, a permanent, is a permanent connection here and now with God and the others. Reason is freedom and renewal of creation every day for it is a lived practice in reality that renews itself and changes every day. This interpretation of reason in the Quranic context is perhaps rejected by a large part of Muslims, for it breaks the bounds of the methodology of interpretation followed by the ancient scholars who refer the etymology of the word aql to the process of binding the legs of the camel together so that it cannot move. Whereas it is religious and ethical references derived from aqala is called that way because it prevents its possessor from getting into trouble or in other words it restricts his movements. This is also the reason defined by Al-Ghazali, the greatest of the ancient Imams, the mind which once it testifies the truthfulness of the Prophet 
must cease to act. On the other hand, Imam Muhammad Abdo, 19th century, says a Muslim must not take his beliefs or fundamentals of his practice from anybody except from the Book of God and the practice Sunnah of his Prophet. Every, Mus every Muslim must understand from God through the Book of God and from his Prophet through the speech of the Prophet without the mediation of any uh, forefathers or successors. However, the great Imam himself, as well as other reformist Imams like him, are accused of being agents of infidel West, attempting to destroy religion from within. The Quran presents reason as a guarantee of harmony between the human being and the nature, the worshipper and his Lord, the I and the other. Reality, however, presents a different kind of harmony. The harmonious coexistence of contradictions between reason and reality, between I and the other. What is the origin of these contradictions in Islam today, between religion and religiosity, text and the practice, reason and the freedom? This contradiction is the result of a long-lived phenomenon which I call coexistent contradiction. What I mean by that is, what I mean by that is the, uh, what I mean by that is the state in which Modernity and the tradition are not opposed to each other, but rather involved in an interplay whose output are forms uh, of uh, reci uh, reciprocal adaption to one another in the context of a culture which is neither modern nor traditional anymore. Modernity has established a complex relation with heritage in which each of them has managed to adapt to the other. This resulted in a complicated process in which both the modern and traditional cultures were constantly reformulated and remodeled, giving rise to both a fake modernity and a fake tradition, embodied by lifestyle, public views, and the mixture of both in which contradictions coexist in harmony. Fake modernity disfigures the tradition as much as it disfigures the authentic manifestations of modernity. The best proof of this is the rejection of the rational dimension in both of them. This leads to the coexistence of distorted elements of tradition with distorted elements of modernity, merging into a new mixture of both. And I might give some examples to, to explain what I mean by this bad mixture between false modernity or false rationality and false tradition. And when I, these elements can be applied to modernity, to Arab modernity, as well as Islamic tradition. The separation, the separation between means and goals, the means becoming more important than the goals. In many Islamic countries now, we find the applying the penalties like cutting off the hands of the thief are much more important than the goal of this penalty which protecting wealth. All penalties now are much more important than the goal for which these penalties, penalties were stated at the first place in Quran and in Islam. The search for legitimacy, 
in the past, the search in, in the past for legitimacy in present. Also, this happening for both, for modern and for tradition. None of uh, Muslim intellectual, liberal, or Islamists are concerned about the present. Both of them are more concerned about past. Everybody go to past looking for a proof, looking for a saint, looking for a scholar who justify his approach to reality now. So, present is always a prisoner of the, the past. The contradiction between the contradiction between form and the content. This we can find in what's so called the Islamization of modernity. Some extremists, some Muslim extremists who refuse modernity, refuse everything Western, they use cell phones. And when you say to them, how can you use a cell phone? It's a product of the West, of the infidel West. And they, because they put instead of the music some verses of Quran on the cell phone, the cell phone become an Islamic cell phone and it can be used. Liberals and modernists are not much different because we have seen, we have seen in our country how liberal an institution spent the tens of years justifying tyranny and dictatorship. So we always see this kind of contradiction between the form and the content. The uh, fourth element is the renunciation of thinking left to the elite. So this society is not practicing rationality anymore because this is left for the liberal elite who work as mediators between West and the Islamic world or for the Islamist elite who work as mediators between here, uh, between present and the past, between us and our ancestors. Exclusion, and this is a very interesting point. Fundamentalists and the modernists, both, they exclude the different. The extremists, in order, uh, they reject the dialogue because the other is different. And modernists, they reject their own identity. They reject their own difference for the sake of dialogue with the other. So we have this two type of exclusion, the exclusion of the different and the exclusion of the difference. The seventh one is the identification with the model or in the lingua of Don Giussani, or in the language of Don Giussani is ideology. Liberals and the modernists, as well as Islamists, are very ideological. They don't use reason, because even Marxists, they replace Quran, but what Marx said. And the same do, the same liberals are doing. The seventh element is the lack of harmony with time and the place and the lack of harmony between time and the place. All intellectuals in Islamic world are divided into two currents. The first one, liberals and the modernists, who live now in the present moment, but their minds and their hearts are belonging to there, to the West. So they live now, but they don't live in here. 
the fundamentalists are living here. But for them, the paradise have taken place in our past, and we should repeat this past. So they are living here, but they are not living now. So this is a serious separation between here and now in Islamic or in Arabic mind now. The only way out of this contradiction is education. The only, uh, without education, a society becomes a thrill, recycling the past without acquiring the same achievements, living the present without realizing its potentials and waiting for a future that does not contain any place for it. However, the educational process is not just the transmission of values, ideas, and beliefs from a generation to another. The word education in Arabic, tarbiyah, derives from the root rabawa, which has the meaning of increasing, growing, and developing. Thus, the true education is the process of adding to and developing these values by charging them with a new human content. And this is done by practice them in our daily lives so that they become the subject of reflection and interaction. In this sense, the preservation of values and the tradition does not mean freezing them but rather developing them and making them assume new forms that gives expression to a new reality in this way the relationship with the past becomes fruitful the past should be offered only by means of a living experience and a lived reality this is what makes a critical approach to the past possible because a constructive, fruitful criticism does not separate the abstract theoretical knowledge from the true human experience. This is the only kind of criticism capable to revive values and the traditions and add to them. The worst dangers facing the educational process are imitations and inhibitions of creativity. In fact, what else is education if not, pro if not the process of exciting curiosity and the quest questioning, stimulating research and knowledge, developing a person's awareness and understanding of the world and allowing him to be able to assume a positive attitude towards all that surrounds him. Education is nothing else than building the ability of a person to establish a fruitful relationship with himself, the others, and the whole world. Traditions are not made to be preserved. They are made to be lived. And living the traditions means reproducing them in a creative way. As Goethe said, what you have inherited from your fathers, you have to acquire it again if you want really to possess it. Education then is not the preservation of traditions, but the interaction with a critical self-awareness. In this sense, the tradition are the addition to these values made by a newer generation, which by practicing them lives the experience of the previous one. 
It is the creative action in a relationship with tradition, reality, and the other that shapes human identity and provides and provides the lost harmony between the now and its history and the here and its surrounding. This is why developing the ability to act and interact should be the highest goal of any educational process. The educational process is not just a simple ritual that society performs with every new young generation to live an eternal spring. It is the development process which resembles the growth of a tree whose crown cannot rise to the sky unless it, its roots are deeply planted into the ground. Any reform which does not combine reason, education, and freedom will not, will not be succeed. And any education will not account on an encounter, will not be successful. Because this is my own personal experience encountering you here in Meeting Remini. Thank you. Thank you. Bene, l'applauso, l'applauso è meritato, ma lo interrompo perché so well deserved applause. However, I would like to interrupt it because Professor Hassan requested me one minute for a very short remark, and then I will give the floor to Robert Riley because he's found uh, the sheet of paper that he was looking for. So now we want to desperately know what uh, this prayer is about. Thank you very much. I tried to be brief in my presentation. However, I have one more remark on what I heard from Professor Rayleigh, because he made me remember when uh, he talked about uh, the heart that uh, a similar thing that we all human beings have, uh, as uh, Father Josangi says uh, in his wisdom, is when he talked about Al Mamun, the Caliph, and uh, the supremacy of reason in the golden age of the Muslims, even the word education and its Arabic etymology comes from the height. Those who are well educated with wisdom are as if they are on a hill, on a height. That is, uh, they embrace all the others and they respect all the others. When I mentioned uh, Lodovico Ariosto, who went on the moon uh, to find, uh, for Orlando Furioso to find his mind back, uh, I exactly wanted to say that unless we shoulder the responsibility to educate uh, future generations based on reason, with all its meanings, then we will pay the cost and we will never get to fruitful results. And I would like to finish by saying that uh, we shouldn't think that this is all extremely difficult. When I received my education from the cultivated Muslims who understood the real content of Islam, I experienced my religion by getting in touch, by respecting the others, and I experienced all my life, the ones that was mentioned by Professor Well. We worked together with the Combonian Fathers for seven years in an environment of mutual respect, love, friendship, and human brotherhood. Therefore, in my opinion, if we try and prepare the trainers, the teachers, the Russian, the reason, the rationality will win. I am optimistic. And rationality will win against irrationality. And therefore, we should never lose our hope. This is so much true that I have so many experiences in my life, in my past life, and now my experience comes out for the second time at the Rimini meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, in the meantime, Robert Riley mentioned that he's found uh, 
that sheet of paper that he was desperately looking for, and we were very curious about knowing this prayer. So please, I give you the floor for, to conclude our meeting, this chance where I personally learned very much, and I believe this is one of the greatest successes of this meeting. When we learn something, then the meeting adds to our humanity. You have the floor, Robert. I'm so grateful to Professor Fontalan for allowing me to end where I intended to begin. Uh, you know what the great discovery of human nature means? This great gift of reason and philosophy reveals to us in the idea of human nature. It means Professor Fatah Hassan, Roberto Fontalan, Wael Farouk, and I, and all of you, have souls that are ordered to the same good. That's what human nature means. And that good, each in our own way, each in our own way, we know that good is God. That's my brief introduction to this prayer, which I had wanted to surprise you with without telling you its origin, but you already know it's from the seventh circuit of the Kaaba during the Hajj. Here it is. O oh God, I ask of you a perfect faith, a sincere assurance, a reverent heart, a remembering tongue, a good conduct of commendation, and a true repentance. Repentance before death, rest at death, and forgiveness and mercy after death, clemency at the reckoning, victory in paradise, and escape from the fire by your mercy. Almighty One, forgiver, Lord, increase me in knowledge and join me to the good. Doesn't sound so strange, does it? Thank you. Allora, eh, scusate, un solo un secondo. Now, just one second. Our meeting is like a movie with uh, very many ends. And in the meantime, a while, wants to add uh, one more thing to what uh, he's just said. Just one more minute. Muslim character from the folklore called Goha. Uh, Goha one day was in the street looking for something, moving every stone. So some people were passing by him and found him looking for something. So they asked him, can we help you? Yes. All of them, what did you lose? He said, I lost the key of my house. So everybody started to look for the key of the house together with Goha. And after such a long time, somebody stopped and asked him, Goha, where did you drop your key? And he said, inside the house. And people asked him, and why are we looking here in the street? And he said, because the house is dark and the street is enlightened. There is light. So this story of Goha is very important because we have to be aware that the light of our friendship is not going to draw our attention away of the darkness surrounding us. We have responsibility and we should be aware of this responsibility. Thank you. Bene, adesso... Okay, and now this is really the end. This is the end of our beautiful, fascinating and very profound meeting. I think uh, we have the chance in future meetings and on future occasions uh, to continue along this uh, topic. I would like to thank our wonderful speakers and enjoy the evening.